Welcome to the final episode of the Brookings Cafeteria, the podcast about ideas and the experts who have them. I'm Fred Dews. After eight and a half years and more than 430 episodes, I'm closing the doors of the cafeteria. Over these years, I've had the chance to share with you, the listeners, the best insights on and solutions for the policy challenges of our time from hundreds of Brookings scholars and other experts. And I'm humbled that the show was honored with awards and nominations from the Academy of Podcasters and the Ambies. But this is not the end of Brookings Podcasts. While the cafeteria doors are closing, we're still producing other shows and launching new ones on a range of policy topics that will interest you, including Dollar and Cents, the Brookings Trade Podcast, The Current, Foresight Africa, Tech Tank, and Vying for Talent, a new podcast from Brookings and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Visit brookings.edu slash podcasts to learn more and sign up for the podcast newsletter to get notified about new shows. You can also follow us on Twitter at Policy Podcasts for episode highlights. And now, on with the final interview. I'm honored to be joined in the Brookings studio by John R. Allen, Brookings president since November 2017. President Allen is a retired United States Marine Corps four-star general and former commander of the NATO International Security Assistance Force and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. He served in senior diplomatic roles following his retirement from the Marine Corps, including Special Presidential Envoy to the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL. John, welcome back to the Brookings Cafeteria and for the last time. No, thank you, Fred. It's great to be with you. And Fred, it's hard to be difficult to overstate just how important this podcast has been, but also how important your role in all of this has been for eight and a half years. But now we go on to other things, and uh, podcasting continues at Brookings, and your your role in that will be essential. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, John. I appreciate it. So let's start with the biggest foreign policy challenge, the biggest foreign policy crisis we've seen in many years. That's Russia's invasion of Ukraine last month. Recognizing that a lot can happen between now when we're taping this and when this episode airs, what does Vladimir Putin's invasion say about his attitude about Russia's place in the world generally? It would be difficult probably to isolate uh, his views from uh, what has become, I think, a, uh, a relationship with China, uh, which in just the last few weeks was codified, if you will, uh, with a joint statement on the 4th of February, where China and Russia committed themselves to a, a relationship that knows no limits and where nothing is forbidden. Uh, and in that statement, they talk about their own definition of democracy and human rights, their own definition of sovereignty as a state and territorial integrity. Uh, they talk about uh, an unlimited cooperation in, in artificial intelligence and data security and internet governance, things that ought to send a cold chill down all of our spines when we hear China and Russia uh, beginning to combine their efforts uh, in the context of uh, the future and the, the roadmap, if you will, for the 21st century relationship that they intend to travel. So in that context, what it says, I think, to Vladimir Putin is that uh, his expectation was that uh, he would have Chinese support in, in this effort. And I think the jury is still out on what the Chinese knew uh, before the invasion of Ukraine and how the Chinese could potentially be important in this. Uh, now, specifically to Vladimir Putin, his intent has always been uh, to do what he could to restore the greatness, if you will, of the Soviet empire. Uh, he's talked about the fact that the collapse of the Soviet Union was one of the great catastrophes of the 20th century. Uh, but he follows a, a long line of Russian leaders, whether they were Soviet leaders or imperial leaders, who have, has, who have had at the center uh, of their ethos, not just controlling the Russian people, but controlling those people in the neighboring states, which are often called the near abroad, those states uh, that border Russia. And in that regard, what we have seen is uh, a... Uh, revanchism, if you will, of the intent by Vladimir Putin both to uh, control the near abroad, Ukraine being one of those states that borders Russia directly, uh, but also uh, potentially to recreate the greatness of a Russia that is, is now long past in the context of its form of the Soviet Union. At the same time, uh, he has been concerned, deeply concerned, uh, about the eastward expansion of NATO. And you see that echoing in, in his concerns as well. Uh, 
It, and, and your listeners, our listeners, uh, would do well to remember that uh, there have been occasions where in the Central Asian states, where there has been popular uprisings of uh, opposition against the leaders of those states, uh, Russia was very quick. And in fact, January of this year, before the invasion in February, January of this year, there was a popular uh, opposition over uprising in Almaty, in uh, Kazakhstan. And uh, the, the president requested aid from Russia. The Collective Security Treaty Organization, which uh, is an entity of multiple armed forces, uh, armed forces of several states, responded and put that down brutally because Putin simply couldn't have uh, a state going unstable to his rear as he was projecting his attention to, to his front with respect to Ukraine. So it's a compl you've asked a really important question. It's a complex answer. Uh, and what we have seen is, uh, I think, an enormous uh, uh, underestimation, first, of the Ukrainian people, uh, but second, an underestimation of the capacity of the United States to lead uh, the community of democracies in responding uh, to this uh, naked aggression, this invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, his sense was, I believe, I, and I think uh, it's bearing out now, that uh, the Ukrainian military could not or would not fight, that the Ukrainian people would not oppose a Russian occupation, and that the Ukrainian government would collapse. All of those estimates on his part were, uh, were spectacularly wrong. And I don't think he believed that with Ukraine quickly collapsing, uh, the U.S. led, the remnants in his mind of the U.S. led uh, community of democracies, the, the so-called uh, liberal world order, rules-based liberal world, world order, order. I don't think he believed that we could get that organized quickly enough to oppose him, that he would present us with a fait accompli. Uh, and all of his estimations there were, were uh, fatally flawed. And now we see the situation that's unfolding before us. It strikes me that his assumption about uh, Western weakness, about NATO weakness, about European Union weakness uh, have all been turned around. And now we even see countries like Finland and Sweden, which aren't part of the NATO command structure, uh, increasing support for possibly joining NATO. And countries in Europe are uh, trying to uh, fast-track Ukraine into the European Union. Can you talk about uh, how this um, this military action, this invasion of Ukraine, uh, not only uh, belies his assumptions, but actually strengthens that liberal Western uh, United States-led order? Sure. Well, Fred, that's a very – first, your perception is exactly right on the issue, and the question is really important. Uh, the last thing he needed uh, was for the EU to be strengthened – in its cohesion with respect to opposing Russia, because the EU in the end is a, is a economic juggernaut. Uh, it's also a dear friend of the United States. The last thing he needed was for NATO to be unified in a way that we have never seen before. Uh, yet uh, underestimating the strength of the capacity for U.S. leadership of the rules-based liberal world order, uh, underestimating that, I think he was completely surprised by how quickly NATO came together uh, with uh, an unambiguous American commitment to Article 5 of the NATO Charter, if you will, the Treaty of Washington, uh, how quickly the EU came together, how quickly non-aligned states with respect to NATO uh, have uh, reinvigorated a conversation about whether they want to join or not. Sweden has already been warned by Russia that uh, Russia will react negatively if it attempts to join NATO. I was just uh, speaking to a conference of Nordic CEOs last week here in Washington, and there was enormous interest in Finland, to your point exactly, Fred. There's enormous interest in Finland, which has a very long border with uh, Russia, uh, about becoming part of NATO. So the, the equilibrium that he had sought to disrupt to his favor has in fact consolidated uh, very much uh, against his uh, desires and against his aspirations with respect to increasing his control over uh, segments of Europe, potentially fragmenting the European security architecture, uh, and ultimately, potentially, even separating the desire of the Europeans to have a relationship with the United States. All of those assumptions were wrong, and all of that has been turned on him. 
Well, uh, let's leave Russia now for a moment. Uh, let's leave the Russia-Ukraine crisis for a moment because we can't know where it's headed. Let's go over to China. You mentioned the the emerging and perhaps strengthened China-Russia relationship, perhaps as explained in that February 4th uh, agreement that they made. Um, but just thinking about China specifically, John, we heard a few years ago President Xi uh, has a plan for China to become the global leader in every area possible by 20. 50, um, including military power, but also um, artificial intelligence and in other areas. So uh, what's your assessment now of China's trajectory? And, and are we, are, should we be finished with saying rising China? It feels like China has already risen. Well, Fred, that's a, a very important question, and it's extraordinarily important right now uh, because of the reality that we're facing uh, in Ukraine. Uh, again, for your listeners, if they have not done it, they should go read the 4 February joint statement. Uh, it is really a manifesto uh, for how China and Russia see the world today and, and where they intend to steer the world in the future. And you're right, President Xi Jinping has, has uh, made a number of public statements with respect to how he wants to position China in the future. Uh, how much of what is made in China is ultimately sold in China, how much uh, China is involved in the international community, uh, China's capacity to master uh, emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, biotech, et cetera, and ultimately where he intends to position China by the middle part of the century. He's been very clear on that. And I think that while there was uh, and remains potentially, uh, while there was significant interest in a relationship with China where we could find areas of common interests, uh, areas where there might be common opportunities to cooperate, collaborate, recognizing that we still, in the context of uh, two great powers on the surface of the planet, economically powerful, uh, would still compete with each other. Uh, I think we've now uh, moved into a dynamic where we're not quite sure uh, about the capacity for uh, our relationship with China to be one that is collaborative or cooperative moving forward. Again, the Chinese have, were very clear in that statement that democracy to them is not democracy as we understand it, that human rights to them, understanding that a million Uyghurs are in concentration camps, if you will, in the Xinjiang province, is not the same as human rights to us, that the rule of law, international rule of law, which which the Chinese will say uh, shapes their own view on the, the inviolate nature of a country's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Yet one of the two ends of the China-Russia axis <laughs> uh, issued the agreement and then turned around and violently uh, violated the sovereignty uh, of a fledgling democracy. So just as, just as though the, this definition of democracy uh, as defined by them in that statement, uh, sets a new standard with respect to their willingness to tolerate the participation of, of the, uh, the populace in the actual actions of governance, the Russians turned right around and have frankly wrecked a young democracy on their border. And so where the Chinese come down on this, I think, is one that we're very interested in understanding. Because while there are many of us, myself included, that looked for a 21st century where, in fact, we might find ways for the Chinese to be fellow travelers in this world, I'm not so sure now. In the aftermath of that statement and in the aftermath of Russian, uh, naked Russian aggression, massively articulated and characterized by uh, violations of the laws of armed conflict and international humanitarian law, where are the Chinese in this? Clearly the Chinese greenlighted this invasion. But the question is now, what are they going to do about it? And how can they recover the fact that uh, the junior partner in this relationship, in fact, is violating every dimension of what we all hold as uh, the sovereign truth, that inherently human rights are preeminent in how we should govern our states, that democracy is important, that the rule of law is paramount. All of those things that are important to us, which are espoused by the Chinese and the Russians, have been, have been uh, violated by what we have seen underway in the last three weeks. So I, I, I listen to what Xi Jinping has said. Uh, I'm attentive to what he has said. And there is context for what he has said now with that 4 February statement and how the Chinese are behaving in the aftermath of that invasion. And we should all be watching that very closely as we go forward. 
Well, I wish we had more time, John, to continue on a uh, foreign policy focus. There's so much more to cover from climate change to uh, global education, development in, in Africa, uh, global trade. Uh, listeners, I encourage you to visit our website, brookings.edu, to find all manner of scholarship and podcasts on these topics. But I'd like to shift our focus now uh, closer to home. Um, Andre Perry, senior fellow in Brookings Metro, was on this show um, a couple of months ago. Uh, and he was mostly there to talk about the new Brookings NAACP partnership. Uh, and he talked about issues like the rise of white supremacy, bigotry, misinformation, and disinformation. And I'm going to quote something he said. He said those issues are threatening the very existence of Brookings. So it's not simply something to do out of our moral take on this. I mean, we won't exist if facts can't hold weight. How do we ensure that Brookings Institution remains relevant and actively engaged in countering these and other trends that we see both at home and abroad in the 21st century? Well, Andre's right. Uh, we should all listen very closely to what Andre Perry has to say on almost any question or any issue. Um, first, I would say that one of the ways that Brookings remains relevant is, is exactly to the point of, of why he was on this podcast, which is to talk about this new partnership. Uh, the NAACP is, uh, is a storied organization that has done a great deal for Americans, all Americans, but certainly Americans of color, the black community. Uh, and a five-year partnership with the NAACP is exactly the kind of thing that Brookings should be endeavoring to pursue uh, with other organizations that stand for its justice, social justice and equity. Uh, but his point about the existence of Brookings is, is not so much whether someone will wash us uh, away overnight. The issue is that truth is under direct assault. Uh, and Brookings has to be an exemplar of truth. It has to be a beacon of truth. And that comes from the capacity for us to do the kind of comprehensive research that incorporates the rich strength of diversity in this country that can bring all views to the table, that can bring the commitment of the institution to our own diversity and to diverse research to the table so that the truth that we purport to produce in our scholarship is an inclusive and diverse truth. Uh, otherwise, uh, when you don't have all of the views or all of the data or all of the input uh, that is uh, incorporated in the nature and the depth of the research, then the outcome can be questioned, the outcome can uh, ultimately be dismissed. And Brookings has always had uh, very comprehensive uh, research and our reputation for truth uh, has been very strong. But in a world where there are alternative facts, in a world where there is systemic racism, in a world where social media has given voice and form to white supremacists in ways we have never seen before. And they've always been there. They are the enemy among us. And they're a national security threat, frankly. But in a world where there are so many competing voices, there's even greater requirements for Brookings research to, to benefit from the, the enormous value of diverse research so that our outcomes are, in fact, what people look to. Uh, ultimately to represent the truth that is a truth for equity and justice uh, and, and racial equality. And uh, that, in, that Brookings and NAACP partnership uh, is uh, on our website and also the interview with Andre Perry. People can find that. John, I want to uh, narrow the focus again a little bit more to just the people sitting at this table. Um, I, for a very brief season, was a uh, U.S. Army officer in the National Guard and Reserve. Um, very brief time of service, and yet that time, uh, uh, I still think about that time today. Uh, the lessons I learned and the, the values that I learned are still with me every day. You, of course, were a United States Marine Corps officer for, I believe, nearly 40 years. You come from a, a family of uh, people who served in the United States military. Uh, what lessons do you apply from your uh again, long career as a United States Marine Corps officer and also a senior diplomat um, to leading this institution? Well, in, in a, Fred, in a very uh, real way, the institution sort of leads itself. Uh, and why is that? Because I arrived at an institution that was dedicated and committed almost in every possible way to something that's pretty simple, doing good, uh, doing good in the world. Uh, and I could have stayed in government. I could have gone back into government. Uh, 
but what I wanted to do was to be part of an institution, and I've been uh, given the great privilege and honor of leading the institution, to be part of an institution that every single day is doing good. Uh, and it's doing good for uh, every, I hope, uh, and will continue to do good and expand the capacity for us to do good for every sector uh, of our population, every community of our citizens, uh, our capacity to govern each other in a fair and decent way, uh, ultimately to uh, recover the, the strength of our middle class, which has been under enormous duress in the last several years for all kinds of reasons, political, economic, um, social, racial stresses, etc., cetera, disorder. Uh, and uh, I want Brookings to be at the heart of that, and not just in, in terms of uh, our domestic and national equilibrium, but I want Brookings to be consequential on the world stage as well. But it's difficult for America to lead on the world stage when it, it's difficult for us to lead on the domestic stage. And one of the very few think tanks in this country, if not the only think tank in this country, a public policy research institute that has the breadth and the width and the depth to do research across all of those sectors is the Brookings Institution. Uh, and we are capable of doing that. We're well-resourced uh, funders who are very generous, uh, provide uh, the kinds of resources necessary for a world-class uh, organization, a, a world-class set of researchers and uh, academicians and scholars to provide the kinds of research and outcomes necessary for not just our doing good, but to heal the wounds of this country and to help us to reconcile these deep wounds that didn't start just four or five years ago. They've been underway for many, many years, and in the case of, of black Americans, it's been underway for centuries. And Brookings has a role to play in that, and it's now a role that we can actively play. Uh, so I'm honored to be part of the institution. <clears throat> and my very commitment to the troops that I led in combat uh, in several wars uh, is the same kind of commitment that I have to this institution and the scholars here. We are an institution and an engine for doing good, and I'm going to do everything within my power to, to permit that to continue. Well, John, one thing I learned in my years as hosting this podcast is when to end an interview. And this feels like the exact right moment to end this interview. Uh, John, I want to thank you for sharing with us your time and expertise today, but more generally, uh, thank you for leading this organization um, over the years, and especially these very difficult last two years that we've been dealing with COVID. I really appreciate it. it. And thank you for your leadership as well. It's been terrific, and this podcast is really an iconic effort by Brookings, and thank you for what you've done for this. And now the cafeteria is closed. It's been a real privilege to host this podcast, and I have a lot of people to thank for contributing to its success. Thank you, listeners, for joining us every week to hear from top experts on such a vast range of policy challenges and solutions. Your listenership and feedback made it possible for me to continue creating new episodes. I always tell other podcasters to put listeners first, to understand that a host is lucky to be in the booth with guests and should ask the kinds of questions that the audience would like to ask if they could. And also thank you to all the guests who have been on this show, both Brookings scholars and non-Brookings experts as well. I've enjoyed interviewing all of you. Many colleagues here at Brookings, past and present, have contributed to making the Brookings Cafeteria possible. I'll start with the audio engineers, two of them. Gaston Reberedo, who has made all Brookings podcasts sound better since 2016. And before him, my former colleague, Zach Kulzer, who was my first partner in creating and launching the podcast. Also, a special thanks to all our audio interns over the years who have joined us from the audio technology program at American University, and all the other communications interns who I hope learned a little something about creating public policy audio content. My thanks to Andrea Rosado, Soren Messner Zidel, and Ian McAllister, who provided essential support and guidance over the last few years. And before them, I have to thank a line of generous colleagues, including Camilo Ramirez, Emily Horn, Richard Fawal, and my former communications vice president, David Nassar, who said to me way back in 2013 that we should have a podcast and that I should host it. Also, Bill Finan, who joined me a few years ago to host interviews about Brookings Press books. I count nearly 60 such interviews. So thank you, Bill, for that tremendous contribution. Also, I want to recognize a host of other colleagues, present and past, who helped make the Brookings Cafeteria podcast possible. From audio editing to promotions to web support to art to strategic advice, including Eric Abalahin, Lizette Baylor, Eric Bull, George Burroughs, Rebecca Campany, Colin Cruikshank, Brennan Hoban, Mark Holscher, Remen Preet Kaur, 
Taylor Kelly, Chris McKenna, Jessica Pavone, who designed the first cafeteria logo, a juice box, Chris Peters, Adriana Pita, Vanessa Sauter, Ashley Woodshelling, Rebecca Weiser, and Marie Wilkin. Thank you all. Remember to check out other Brookings podcasts on our website, brookings.edu slash podcasts. Subscribe to the podcast's newsletter and follow us on Twitter at Policy Podcasts. Until we meet again, I'm Fred Dews. Well done. Well done, Fred. Well done. Thanks. Well done. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.